Amen. Um, so we are in week three of the You Asked For It series. And this week, here's the question, what about angels and demons? So a little bit of light fare for us today, right? Uh, you asked for it on this one, and so we're going to dive into this really, really massive topic. Um, here's just some of the questions that you guys actually asked. Number one, tell us about angels and demons. What about spiritual warfare? What is the evidence of the spiritual realm and things not seen? Because I can't see it. Amen? I can't see it. So how do I know it's actually there? So we're going to take you guys to the scripture today. And this is a massive topic. And I think you guys are going to enjoy it. First, let's start with a quote from C.S. Lewis. Because I always love C.S. Lewis. Um, look at this. It says, There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. And by that he means evil spirits. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both heirs, and they hail the materialist on one side or a magician on the other side with the same delight. So he's saying there's two extremes we can be about the spiritual realm today. Number one, we can be in that space where we look, under, look for a demon under every rock. Like, like we ran out of gas. There must be a, a demon of the gas tank. Amen? Like we're going into Thanksgiving and the turkey is dry because the turkey is almost always dry, right? Must have been an evil spirit in the stove. Mother-in-law for sure is possessed by a demon. Right, like we find ourselves over here, like kind of blaming the devil for everything. Or you can be on the flip side, which is, I don't believe in the spiritual realm at all. And the problem with that is that your Bible believes in it. And Jesus believed in it. And he talks about it as if it's this whole side to your reality. And if you ignore it, there's consequences for ignoring it because... He's real whether you know about him or not. Okay, so let's go to 2 Kings 6. I got two big sections of scripture. I'm going to walk us through because it's really going to help you understand the way that this all works. Uh, very first one, 2 Kings chapter 6. This is about Elisha, the prophet. Say Elisha. Elisha. So if you went to Sunday school, it was Elijah or Elisha, and you never knew, and you always got him confused. Amen? Anybody else? Just me, maybe. Elisha was the second prophet. So Elisha the prophet, powerful man of God in the Old Testament, 2 Kings 6. And here's kind of what was happening. So there was this foreign army called the Arameans and the king of Aram. So Aram was the country. And the king of Aram was always sending his army against the Israelite army because he wanted to defeat them. But here's what would happen. Whenever he had a military strategy and he was sending his army to a particular place, Elisha would hear from God that this is what was about to happen. He would then warn the king of Israel to move his army to a different spot. And the king of Aram could never find him. And one day, the king of Aram gets really, really mad about this. And he thinks he's got a spy in his midst who's informing the Israelite army. And one of his people says, no, 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 it's not that at all. They've actually got a prophet who actually hears from God. And so this is the scene, verse 13. Go and find out where he is, the king commanded, so I can send troops to seize him. He's talking about Elisha here. And the report came back, Elisha is at Dothan, and so one night the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. Now who's the army for? One guy. You ever wake up in the morning and feel like there's an entire army that came against you? Just in your life? This is that day for Elisha. And so his servant is about to wake up, and it's about to get comical. Verse 15, when the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning and went outside, right, just to get his coffee, like stretch a little bit, there were the troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. Oh, sir, what will we do now? The young man cried to Elisha. That's exactly how you would have reacted. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are many more on our side than on theirs. And at this point, the servant thinks he's nuts, right? 
But verse 17 happens. Then Elisha prays, O Lord, open his eyes and let him see. Open his eyes and let him see. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. Chariots of fire. So what's going on here? A physical army has come against Elisha in the physical realm. But in a parallel realm, in a parallel spiritual universe, there was another army there all along. They weren't teleported there all of a sudden. They had been there. Amen? They had been there. You just couldn't see them. And so Elisha comes and says, God, I can see him. I know we're not outnumbered, but would you open his eyes? And what he shows you here is that the spiritual realm is a parallel realm. Now, why does that matter? It matters because sometimes we think of the spiritual realm as another place. Sometimes it's like heaven, like if we went up into the sky and we went up high enough and deep enough into space, we might suddenly discover heaven. Sometimes we talk about it like that. Or sometimes we talk about hell. Like if we drilled down into the earth's crust deep enough, we might eventually find hell. But that's not the way the Bible actually talks about this. The Bible talks about it as if it's right next to us all the time. So where are my Marvel fans at today? Anybody? So you get, you get to Marvel Endgame, right? And forgive me for the reference if you haven't seen it. But it's, there's a point in Endgame where, where you've got Tilda Swinton, who's like the Sorceress Supreme, and she's on the roof with the Hulk. You remember that scene? She's on the roof with the Hulk, and she like smacks him, right? And all of a sudden, the essence, the spiritual essence of the Hulk pops out of his body. If you haven't seen the movie, you're like, what are you talking about right now? Right. <laughs> Love you, Steve. Oh, it's awesome. Um, so anyway, so the spiritual essence of the Hulk pops out of his body. What's Marvel trying to show you there? It's really, really weird. Marvel is actually trying, whether they know it or not, trying to be biblical. They're trying to show you that there's another spiritual realm laid on top of our realm. And it's there all along, whether you can see it or not, because that's what you see in the scripture here, amen? All right, so let's keep reading. Verse 18, as the Aramean army advanced toward him, Elisha prayed, O Lord, would you make them blind? And so the Lord struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. So he's there, he's surrounded by angels of fire, and what does he do? He doesn't command the angels. Now, this is important. As believers in Jesus Christ, we don't give orders to angels. We don't. Some people will tell you that. That's not what we do. What do we do? We ask Jesus to command his angels. Right? Like we go to the authority and the authority tells them what to do. So Elisha, even though he's surrounded by all these angels, he says, God, would you strike all these people blind? And who actually strikes them blind? The passage implies it's the angels that strike them blind. But God told them to. Because that's why they're there. That's why there's so many. Right? Just a little stuff for your prayer life there. Now let's go to Daniel 10. This one will also blow your mind. Daniel 10. So in Daniel 10, Daniel gets a vision from God. Is this Daniel in the lion's den? Yes, it is. Same guy, Daniel. But that was early in his career. This is a little bit later in his career. Okay, so we're going to Daniel 10, and he gets this amazing vision. Now, some of you guys get weird dreams, or you even get visions, and sometimes you'd like, I would like it if someone could interpret all the weird stuff that I saw. Daniel gets a weird vision. He wants an interpretation. So here's what he does. He starts praying and asking God for an interpretation of his vision. And it takes three weeks. He prays and he fasts for three weeks. Have you ever prayed a long time for something? Have you ever prayed a long time for something? You're like, God, why aren't you answering this right away? God, why do I have to pray so long? He prays and he fasts for three weeks. And here's what happens Verse 4, on April 23rd, I love that he gives us the date because he knows how long he's been praying. 
As I was standing on the bank of the great Tigris River, Daniel said, I looked up and I saw a man dressed in linen clothing with a belt of pure gold around his waist. His body looked like a precious gem. His face flashed like lightning and his eyes flamed like torches and his arms and feet shone like polished bronze and his voice roared like a vast multitude of people. <laughs> I love this. When human beings see a, a spiritual being, we have no idea what we're looking at. That's what you see here. Like, we kind of freak out a little bit. So Elisha said, hey, it looks like an army of fire because they're glowing and it's crazy and I don't even know how to describe it. And Daniel gives you his way of trying to describe it. And when you read all the different biblical accounts, don't get so hung up on the descriptions or the detail because they're just doing their best with human words to describe what they're seeing. Does this make sense? Verse 8, my strength left me, he said. My face grew deathly pale, and I felt very weak. Then I heard the man speak, and when I heard the sound of his voice, I fainted and lay there with my face to the ground. Poor Daniel. Passed out. I think you would have passed out, too. Definitely I would have. Verse 10, just then a hand touched me and lifted me up, still trembling to my hands and knees because he passed out. And the man said to me, Daniel, you are very precious to God. Thank you. So listen carefully to what I have to say to you. Stand up for I have been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up still trembling. Verse 12, then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel, since the first day, watch this, since the first day that you began to pray for understanding, and to humble yourself before God, your request has been heard in heaven, and I came in answer to your prayer. So he says, I was dispatched on the very first day you started to pray. Now that's weird, because it took him 21 days to get there. Sometimes we go to pray, and there's a delay in our answer. And we assume the reason for the delay is God. He's chosen to delay. You're about to see that's not always the case. Again, this should impact your prayer life, verse 13. But for 21 days, he says, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. And then Michael, <coughs> one of the archangels, came to help me, and I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now I am here to explain what will happen to your people in the future, for this ver vision concerns a time yet to come. Crazy. If we could leave that up for just a second. He says, for 21 days there was a spiritual battle. Now this passage should impact your theology. He describes a spirit realm in detail, and he says, this is impacting your prayer life. I was dispatched on day one, and then he starts to, in the spirit realm, he starts to travel to Daniel, and he gets hung up by the spirit prince of Persia. Persia's a country, it's a kingdom. So he, what he says here is he's like, there's a demon that is so powerful, this is a fallen angel, so powerful that he is over an entire country. And he's the one who stopped me. And we fought for 21 days. What did that look like? I have no idea. Were there swords involved? Were there guns? I don't know. They opposed each other. We're not told that detail. They opposed each other. He could not go forward and get the, get the interpretation to Daniel until Michael, the archangel, which is one of the three that we know of, uh, angels or demons that are described by name in scripture, Michael the archangel. He is the prince angel over God's people, Israel. He comes to lend muscle to the fight. And that's how the angel gets free. Is your mind blown yet? There's a parallel realm. And what matters? Distance matters. Angels and demons are in a battle over what's going on with God's people. Amen, are you seeing all this? Time matters. Countries matter. Like they're there, but whether or not they interact with us, that's up to God, amen? Whether or not they interact with us, that part is up to God. This is in your Bible. Let me give you some more about angels. This is, we're, just, we're still setting the table here. More about angels. Number one, angels were created before the earth. This is in Job 38. 
If you're a note taker, you can look up these verses later. I'm not going to read them to you um, in detail, but this is just for your study. But I'll just move through them quickly. First, angels were created before the earth. Job there says that they were created and they actually watched the earth get completed by God and they rejoiced when they saw the finished project. They were there worshiping. Next, angels are spirits in the spirit realm. But even though they're spirits, they can physically interact with you if God allows it. <clears throat> we see this again in the first few chapters of the book of Job. There are times when angels will approach God in the throne and say, can I interact with people in this way? And God is the one who says yes or no. They cannot do anything that he does not allow them to do. Next, they can physically visit you. They visit Abraham and Sarah. They visit Lot at one point. Angels are also persons with emotion and intellect and will. Understand that. They're, they're the ones who choose whether or not they will follow God, just like you choose whether or not you will follow God. Because we're going to see about a third of the angels rebelled against God and chose to fight against him and his people. You're going to see that later on. Angels are innumerable. There's a, a passage there in Daniel that says that there are 10,000 times 10,000. And I actually pulled out a calculator and did math on that. That's 100 million angels. Now, it may be that the Bible's trying to tell us there's 100 million angels, or it may just be that it's given us a really large number to say they're impossible to count. Next, God's children have angels assigned to them. Does that encourage you today? If, if you're a born-again Christian... There are angels that have been assigned to you. And what Jesus says is he says, your angels, and he uses the pronoun, your angels stand before God and see the face of God every single day. And why would they be seeing the face of God? Because God is the one who's like, hey, listen, Josh didn't use his turn signal. He's about to get into a car crash. I want you to go save his butt right now. It's God who tells them what to do. It's not like an angel follows me around. That's not the biblical picture, even though that's what we've read before, maybe in our culture. It's not that an angel follows me around. It's that they're before God and God dispatches them. And that's how it works. When God's children die, angels carry you to paradise. I love that. Next, angels rejoice over every sinner that repents and finds Jesus. So that's angels. What about Satan? What about the devils and the demons? This is Revelation 12, verse 7. It says, Then there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against... There's Michael again. Did you see him? Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, that's Satan, and his angels. And the dragon lost the battle, and, he is, and his angels were forced out of heaven. This entire scene, I believe, took place before the earth was created. Dragon lost the battle. He and his angels were forced out of heaven. The great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the world, was thrown down to earth with all of his angels. So the Bible describes that there was war. There was a moment when Satan decided that he no, no longer wanted to follow God. Right? And he starts, up, he starts up a movement in heaven and he finds a third of the angels who follow him. And then of the third of Satan's angels fight against the other two-thirds of the angels that remain and are underneath Michael. And so you got two generals that go to war with each other. Notice this important point. Satan does not fight against God. Why? Because it wouldn't last two seconds. So he fights against Michael. The, those, those two are enemies. And it gets to a point where in the midst of the war, Satan and his angels, they're all thrown down. I believe that is the moment that God got involved and it was quickly over. This is what Jesus says about it. He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That's Luke chapter 10. Jesus said that. Why, Why would Jesus say, I saw him fall like lightning? Because it's fast. Like if that had been a movie, it'd be a very, very short movie. When Satan was defeated by God, there was no contest at all. He felt like lightning. It was over. And you need that encouragement today because as we go to start to talk about spiritual warfare, when we get to that part of the message, there is no contest between Jesus and the name of Jesus and our enemy. And when you ask God for help, it is not a matter of speed. God is in charge. 
Okay, so you've got all this information. You've been taught all this stuff about angels and demons. The next question is, why should you care? Right, like, is this just nice, helpful information? Is it meant to entertain us that this is all going on? No. There's a reason to know this second service. Do you want to know this? All right, all right. So why should we care? Because the short answer is because there is such a thing as evil in this world. We face this world and without meaning to, we start to believe the lie that this world is all that there is. And when we experience things that are evil, we start to associate them with people and we associate evil with society and we associate it with government and with policy and with education and with institutions, with family and the way that we are raised with churches and religion. We associate it with all these different things. But the Bible's picture is very, very different. That there's actual evil in this universe, and it is organized, and it is ancient, and it is powerful. Nothing compared to Jesus. But it is a thing. And when you see evil, you need to know what to do with it and how to recognize it. Amen? Tim Keller says it like this. He said, temptation, and he, and he switches it to temptation. So he's about to talk about us. He says, temptation isn't personal. There is an actual enemy doing the tempting. The New Testament writers treat Satan as a reality, not a myth. This is certainly jarring in contemporary cultures that are skeptical of the existence of the supernatural, let alone the demonic. Now, I read this to you because... Because this is the moment where we've got to admit that this is a bit of a weird sermon. And this is a bit of a weird topic. And if this is, you're like you're in town for Thanksgiving to visit family and you just stumbled on our church this morning and you came on Demon Week and you're like, great. <laughs> it's where we are. And it's true. And I'm going to tell you this isn't theory. It's true. There's real evil in this world, and we have to learn about it. Ephesians 4, chapter two, or verse 26, it says, And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for angry gives a foothold to the devil. Now, if we keep this verse up for a second, there's actually three parts to this that are super important. So let's talk about anger, if we can. It's a great example. So number one, it says... In your anger, don't, don't sin by letting anger control you. So you might have anger, but don't let your anger turn into sin. Now, why is that th there that distinction? Because anger itself is not sin. And, and some of you guys haven't been told this. Anger is not sin. A anger is actually part of the divine nature. It's actually in God. God experiences anger. Whenever he sees injustice, God feels anger. But God then acts and when God acts, it's always good. Amen? So God doesn't get angry and then hurt people or be vindictive about it or be cruel about it. That's not his way. Unfortunately, as human beings, we feel anger and we often sin with it. So in your anger, do not sin. Second thing it tells us about anger here is that don't let the sun go down on your anger. And it's talking to people who are in relationship with each other. And it's saying when you're angry with each other. Don't let the broken relationship continue on. Now, some people may have told you, like, you literally can't go to bed at night until you've got the thing fully resolved. And some of you guys are talkers, and you keep talking to two, three, and four in the morning, and things get worse, and you're like, the Bible isn't true. Yes, it is, but that's not what it meant. Some of you guys need a nap, and then you need to finish the argument. Take the nap. But the point of what the Bible's trying to say is don't let the thing go on. You wake up the next morning, get right to it. Wake up the next morning, but if you woke up a week later and we still haven't resolved the thing, what you've done is you've created a space of bitterness and unforgiveness where the enemy can come in and work all kinds of havoc in your relationship. And you've experienced that. We left it unresolved. And some of us, it's our pattern to leave things unresolved. And the third point he says is, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. And he just brought the whole thing into the spiritual realm and said, there's a whole other layer of this and you didn't even know it existed, but it does. Gives a foothold to the devil. So let's unpack that for a second. That's a picture. What's a foothold? 
a foothold is like, it's like a mountain climbing term, right? Like I'm, I'm trying to scale this rock face, right? And I'm looking for a foothold. Why? So that I can cling to this mountain. So I can have stable feet. He's like, you're giving a foothold to the devil in your life. You're giving him a place to stand. Like a parasite. So you ever like let anger in and then you can't shake it? Like we've experienced that. You ever let pornography in and then you find that even though you want to shake it, you can't shake it? You ever let bitterness and unforgiveness into a relationship and you want to shake it and you find that you can't shake it? Anybody else out there? Is it just me? So like there's parasites, right? And like, like why is it so hard to get free from this thing? I only fed this thing for about a month. Why can't I suddenly be free? Because you fed it for a month and you gave it place. Last week we talked about boundaries. How many of you guys were here for the boundaries conversation? So we talked about boundaries last week. One of the things that God considers very, very important in your life is your boundaries. So he gave you property lines. Do you remember that part? He gave you property lines. And so Jesus doesn't come barging in the front door of your soul. Jesus knocks because it's your choice of whether or not to let Jesus in. And then Jesus can come in and have authority there. Do you remember that? It works also the other way. You're the one who can decide to let in evil. Now it's getting personal, right? You can give him a foothold because God has granted you authority in his kingdom. You have authority over your life, over your family, over your space. And you can say, come on in. And once you've said, come on in, that's a problem. And we do this. God is a God of justice. Why does God do this? Because God's a God of justice. And he set up the rules of the game, if you will, at the very beginning of time. And this is how it works. There's a thing called spiritual authority, and you give that authority away. And we've got to be careful about that. And we've got to understand that that's what happened because there are spiritual consequences to our decisions. And we've got to know that because we got to get to a place where we ask Jesus to take it back. Oh, you're really chewing now. I see you. <laughs> we always think it's just about maybe the psychology and the emotion and the relationships and my background and my buttons and all that kind of stuff. Or we think it's about the physical and it's about the chemical and it's about all of that stuff, but it's about the spiritual as well. So how do we fight it? If this is all reality, how do we fight it? Again, I'm so glad you asked. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us. Verse 10, it says, A final word, be strong in the Lord. The most important phrase in that entire passage. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. And I love that it knows what we're tempted to do. It knows that we're tempted to see all of it as physical because it's all that we can see with our physical eyes. But the Bible's very, very clear in multiple places. Don't just see the physical. There's something else that's going on. And the problem is, is that if all you do is see the physical, what you'll end up doing is you'll fight people. And that's what a lot of us are doing. We're fighting our spouse, we're fighting our ex, we're fighting mother-in-law, we're fighting our kids. And the Bible says, hold on a second. Your battle is actually in the spiritual realm. And that's going to help you if you understand that. Because you might stop seeing people as the enemy and seeing the real enemy. It's not just flesh and blood. You soldiers in the room, could you imagine a situation your next battle, let's say your enemy did not believe you existed. How would that be? 
in your next battle, if they didn't believe your army existed, well, that would help, wouldn't it? Here's the point. If you don't believe they exist, they can still hurt you. And it doesn't help you. Verse 13, therefore put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the devil, the enemy, in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. So it actually pictures a battle that we're supposed to engage in as spiritual soldiers over our own life. And let me just say just really, really quickly, if your temptation is to take this and start declaring who has a demon in your life, let me just say as we go into Thanksgiving, do not do that. It's not what I'm advocating at all today. Everything that you're going to see here, if you're honest about the scripture that I'm reading to you, it's not about you identifying spirits in other people that leads to spiritual abuse. Don't do it. You focus on you. You focus on your world, your boundaries, your property lines. And like, God, you got to help me in my battle right here. Make sense? Okay, so three big weapons of our warfare that we've got. Number one, be strong in the Lord. I told you we were going to come back to that phrase. It's massive. Put on the armor and then pick up the sword. Three, three big things. So number one, be strong in the Lord. What that's saying is don't be strong in you. Sometimes you're going to talk to people and they're going to, they're going to express their Christianity to you as if they're like this awesome spiritual warrior kind of a person and they like tell demons what to do in their life. Uh-uh. No, don't do that. Don't go there. It's, it's, it's a really short baby step into pride. And, like, and that's not the way that the Bible describes it. Be strong in the Lord. It doesn't say be strong in yourself. Be strong in the Lord. Batman. You remember Batman? You remember uh, Commissioner Gordon, right? What's so great about Commissioner Gordon? He's got a signal, and that's it. Like, none of us get excited about Commissioner Gordon coming into the story, except for the fact that we know he's got the bat signal, right? I know you're thinking, right? What's his one power? He gets to call the big guy, right? That's you. You don't have anything in the battle. But the battle's already won. It's won by somebody else. It's won by Jesus. And you get to be strong in the Lord. And you get to call on him. Help Jesus. Like if you remember nothing else for this entire sermon, help Jesus. Say it with me. Help Jesus. Help me, Jesus. That's it. That's all you need. Help me, Jesus. Lois Lane, Jimmy, like, they depend on the fact that Superman's got super hearing, right? That's how that works. We don't look to them to be awesome, even though we're, like, rewriting all the Marvel stories, and I get that. That's DC, actually. We're writing all the stories. But anyway, they're the helpless people who know how to call their friend, who actually is powerful. That's the point of them. And the point of us is to glorify Jesus Christ, that he's the only one that's holy, he's the only one that's powerful, he's the only one that's won the battle. And so whenever we get down and whenever we get attacked, we reach out to him. And it's a really short prayer because the devil felt like lightning, amen? He felt like lightning. And Jesus said, you go and pray in my name. Why do we pray in his name? You ever ask that? It's like, that's what they taught me to do in Sunday school. They said, in Jesus' name, amen. Why do we do that? Because we're told to do things in the name of Jesus because all the authority and all the power is in him. Like, when you were a kid and your mom said, go get your brothers and sisters because it's time for dinner. And you walked up the steps. Now, if you were not so smart, you might walk up and say, it's time for dinner. You're supposed to come. And if you do that, they're not coming, are they? They're going to laugh you off. They're going to ignore you. But if you walk up and you say, mom said, doesn't everything change? Mom said, why? Was it magic words? No, it's not magic words. What it is is we all know mom's authority. And we all know what will happen if we don't 
do what she said, <laughs> right? And that's what that authority means in that particular situation. So when you pray something in the name of Jesus Christ, you're saying, I'm saying this, I'm asking this, Jesus, in your authority, in your name, will you move mountains in the spiritual realm? And he will. Amen? He will. Next, put on the armor. Put on the armor. And if you, if you study this passage in Ephesians 6, it's going to talk about all the different pieces of the armor. But armor is defensive, is it not? It's defensive. It's so that you are protected. That's the point of armor. And, and, and it's going to get into faith and righteousness and, and peace and the gospel and all that stuff is in there. But basically what it's doing is it's saying, listen, go back to your relationship with Jesus Christ and the gospel and realize who you are. Because Satan's lying to you. And when you gave a, f- a foothold in anger, the way to undo that is to go and confess that sin of anger to your Savior. And to say, I am sorry that I gave him a foothold and that I invited him into my life and into my family here. And I now renounce that sin. Say renounce. Renounce is an important word because when you say renounce, like I renounce this anger, what you're saying is not only do I feel bad about it, but I don't want this in my life. I want anger gone, and I know I'm a broken human being, and I might end up right back here in anger tomorrow, but I want it gone as far as today is concerned, and I want to walk away from it, and I want that to have no place in my family or in my life. And tell Jesus that, and say, would you take that authority back from the enemy? I want to be clean again. You just walk him through that. That's putting on the armor. Renounce. It's not about blaming people. Do you know there's a plot to destroy my marriage? Not just mine. Yours. There's a plot to destroy this church. There's that many evil spirits out there. And they are attacking God's people. And I know I've been kind of heavy on the superheroes today. But Lex Luthor doesn't go after Superman. He goes after Lois. And you know why? And he goes after Jimmy. You know why? Because he's got nothing with Superman. So he goes after who Superman loves. And Satan goes after you. Because he's got nothing with God. And that's the way this works. I can show you scriptures that back that up. His hatred toward God comes out in his attacks toward you and, and, and your family. And they are ancient and they are intelligent and they are powerful. I don't say that to scare you today. I just say it because they're organized. <laughs> I'm not reading into things. It's just the way that it works. They had, you read the Gospels, they had a plot against Jesus. They knew exactly what they were doing. You read the book of Acts, and they went, went against the apostles, and their church planting planned, they went right against them. They knew exactly what they were doing. And they're coming against you, and they're coming at this church. But what Paul reminds us to do in Ephesians 6 is I don't blame people for it. I realize what's actually going on. And what it does is it drives me not to fight with people, but instead to pray. It drives me to pray. And that's what this should do. It drives you to pray and say, Jesus, you got to help me. Jesus, you got to help me if I've given a foothold anywhere. Jesus, you got to help protect me. Jesus, you got to keep me from the line. What line? The line of failing. The line of destruction coming into my life. Jesus, you got to keep me away from that line. Amen? And then lastly, you got to pick up the sword. Because the enemy is constantly speaking lies to you. And the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. And it's filled with the promises of God. And I'm going to just be brief on this. But the number one lie of the enemy in your life is that you are broken and you are not enough. And you're so full of sin. God doesn't care about you. He doesn't see you. And he doesn't listen to your prayers. And you need to know that, no, 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 I am forgiven, and I am a child of God, and Jesus said so, amen? Amen. And Jesus said so. Last thing. I've told this story before, going to tell it again. Maybe you've been at this church, maybe you've heard heard me talk about this before. Um, There was a time, and Linda's brother, Jeff, and I were in a room, and we were praying. And we were praying, and the reason we were praying is because a pastor that we knew 
had told us he was going into a counseling session that night and he needed us to pray for him. And so we stopped, closed our eyes, sat down and went to go pray. And when we started to pray and Jeff was doing the praying, within seconds, I felt a tremendous weight like somebody had dropped a boulder on my chest. It was physical. I don't have a lot of stories like these, but I'll tell you this one. What was weird about it is that as soon as I felt that, Jeff is praying and he's like, oh God, it feels like somebody put a boulder on my chest. It's like, oh man, he's like, I, I mean, I stopped the prayer. It's like, Jeff, I feel like, you know. So we keep praying. And while we're praying, I, my eyes are closed, but I can see the room that we're in. And I see three demons come into the room. Now you know I've lost my mind, right? And I see three demons come into the room. And again, I think I had bad pizza maybe, something like that. Jeff's still praying. He says, oh God, I just saw three demons come into the room. And they're standing right here. And this is exactly how, how they look. And he starts describing them. And he's describing what's in my mind. And my eyes are closed. And I'm not gonna give you guys detail. <laughs> because I don't think it'd be appropriate or helpful. But that's one of those moments where you know it's like we didn't have a group hallucination there. And God, why did you do that? And, and, and here's the thing. Like once we saw him and we got past ourselves on, on the whole thing, he snapped into action, Jeff did, and he realized God was showing this to us because he wanted us to know what was at stake in this counseling session that was going on. And so he, he prays against it. Jesus, would you cast these demons out? Jesus, would you come against everything that's coming against this counseling session? Jesus, would you bless the pastor because he obviously needs spiritual help right now. And I mean, can you imagine the fire in our prayers in that moment? Like we're praying like crazy because we knew and God wanted us to know. But the second reason, and I mean, those demons left, okay? Like he prayed and cast them out. They were gone. The weight came off our chest. I mean, it was instantaneous. The other reason I think God gave us that story, gave me that story, let me experience that. Because my life is not filled with seeing angels and demons, okay? Like it's just not. I think God showed me that because he knew that I was to be a pastor someday. He knew that I was supposed to stand in front of you. He knew I was supposed to teach you this and not teach it to you as theory. And it's not classroom. Holy crap, it's real. Can I say that to you? Holy crap, it's real. Like people will talk to me sometimes as a pastor and they'll be like, you know what? Like you got to high school, dude, and you probably went to college, went to seminary, you know, and decided like when I grow up, I want to be a pastor someday. And so you just do this thing, you do this religious thing, and it's, it's this great moral code and all this kind of stuff, and you're all into it, and good for you, Josh. No, 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 no. Holy crap, it's real. Okay? Like, it's real. It drives me in a different way to talk to you about this. You need to know this. And I want to talk to the online community really quickly if you're experiencing isolation I don't want anything that we've talked about today to, to, to introduce or sow a seed of fear into your heart because if you're alone you are not alone and we're with you amen we're with you and Jesus is with you and you can pray these same prayers that we talked about today and in Jesus name you can enter into his victory for you and you're not alone you guys stand. There's scriptures that talk about 
the cross of Jesus Christ and how he died for our sins and bled for us. And we always talk about that. But some of these verses say that it, it was at the cross that Jesus defeated darkness, that he defeated Satan and evil. Past tense. So you know the battle, the war is won today. Past tense. And when we say Jesus help, we just, we just ask to enter into that. Let's pray. Lord God, we stand before you, Lord, and, and so many of us, God, around this room, probably all of us, honestly, God, we've given some kind of a foothold. We didn't mean to, we didn't know, but we gave a foothold away. And, and there's some things that we can't shake. And so, Jesus, I pray that you would come and that you would speak those things to us right now because your Holy Spirit is, is so intelligent and individual for us. And, Lord, you can deal with each one of us today. So tell us, Lord. And, God, in Jesus' name right now, we surrender that foothold to you. We repent of the sin that got us there, confess it to you, we renounce it, Lord. We, say, we don't want any part of that anymore, Lord. We, we repent. We turn away from it, Lord, right now. Even if we know we're not perfect, even if we know we can't live perfectly, Lord, we still renounce it today, Lord. Our, our, our intention is to have no part in that anymore, Lord. We hate it. And God, would you reset us, Lord? Would you take that authority away from our enemy? Rebuild our families. Rebuild our lives. Please, Jesus, we love you, Lord, in Christ's name.